you know, I love the Bible. As I get older, I understand it more and more, and I'm like, well, that makes a lot of sense. I like how he did those twists and turns. But, you know, if you weren't raised with that kind of language or raised with those kinds of terminology, sometimes the deeper meaning kind of like whoop, right over the head. And one of the most beautiful prayers, I think, in the Bible is the 23rd Psalms. But I don't know a shepherd. I'm not a shepherd. I can kind of relate to what they're saying about. But I wanted to read if it was to be put in today's language. I saw one little blurb of how somebody had rewritten it, and I had paid attention to that, but I added my own words of what it would be if I was to say the prayer. The 23rd Psalms really will be the entire wrapped-up package of what you can expect if you're a believer. There's benefits that come to believing God. He's a good, good father, and he knows that you have struggles and there's things that you have to give up to walk this road with him, and he's good with rewards. He's good with the recompense. So I want you to know that there's benefits, and John, uh, David tells us some of those benefits in his prayer that he's praying to God. And so familiar prayer, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside the still waters. He restores my soul and he leads me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil for thou art with me. Thy rod, thy staff, they comfort me. Thou preparest a table before me in the presence of my enemies and thou anoints my head with oil and my cup. It runs over. Oh, surely goodness and mercy. It shall follow me all the days of my life. And I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Those are beautiful words. But if it's going to come from my heart, it would sound something maybe a little bit more like this. That the Lord is my constant companion. And he's always looking out for me. And there's no need that he can't supply whether he leads me to the mountaintops of blessings or he and speaks peace into my soul, refreshes my spirit or leads me into the valley of trials and tears, he's always there. He's always there working out all things for my good as he teaches me his ways. Oh, when my soul is heavy and sadness darkens my soul, depression and fear, they cloud my mind even if it's a result of my own wrong decisions, he's still there. He's there to keep me and teach me and comfort me. And then he'll even let me lean on him when life gets too heavy and I can't make it on my own. And if I lean on his ways and not my own, then he will bless my soul with goodness and blessings, even in front of the very ones who wanted to see me fail and fall when they push me down he raises me up but the best of thing of all is that my peace and security they rest in the knowledge that in his words and his promise they're true he'll be near me always he will never leave and let go and i'm his for all eternity and one day i'll see him face to face those are the benefits, and that's just a few of the benefits that you get when you become a believer. But I think it's very important. I talk so much about what to do in life here while we're living, and today we're going to talk about what happens when we take our last mortal breath and our first eternal breath. Once you're a believer you have a promise. In fact, the Bible says, he says it so often, my favorite verse, John 3, 16, he gives us the promise that if we believe in the son that was sacrificed for us, if we believe in him and make him our Lord and Savior, we've got our ticket. We've got our, our passageway straight in to heaven. That's a given. But so many Christians 
live most of their life, and I said the word Christians, afraid that they're not going to make heaven. Afraid that at that last moment, God's going to go, oh, joke's on you, sorry. You can't come in because you didn't do this and you didn't do that and you didn't do this well enough. That's the trick of the enemy because he wants to take this life here and he wants to fill it with anxiety and fear and doubt. But if John 3.16 isn't true in the Bible, then the whole Bible is a lie. John 3.16 says that whoever, that means whatever race, whatever creed, nation, color, tongue, whoever believes in him, Makes him your Lord. You've got your ticket to heaven. When I was in school, I would worry so often in elementary school. Every year when the report cards were going to come out, that final report card that on the back of the report card would say, you pass or you fail, I would be so worried that last few weeks of school because I didn't know. But here's what's crazy. If I would have known to pay attention and realize that I got all A's and B's, there's no way they're going to fail me. But still, I was so worried and I was so nervous when I would open up that envelope and turn it over. I would take a deep breath and I would look down and I would sigh this great sigh of relief of, whew, I made it. I get to go to the next grade. I get to level up. Well, if I would have realized all along, you can't get A's and B's and passing grades and all of a sudden, because the teacher had a bad day, went, whoop, sorry, you got to do all that again. My little last few weeks of school, I would have lived differently. I would have slept better. I wouldn't have had that little nervous knot in my belly, wondering and hoping, am I going to pass? Am I going to pass? And it took the joy out of life. I wasn't my happy-go-lucky self. I had this huge burden on my shoulder, always in the back of my mind. I'd start to have fun with my friends, and then something would say, well, I hope you get to play with them at recess in the next grade, but what if you get held back? That's what the enemy does with us. You go to bed at night, and he says, well, I wonder if you've been good enough. I wonder if you're going to make heaven. I hope you don't burn forever in the lake of fire because you've really messed up this week. See, God's not fickle that way. He secured you in. You have your ticket. But let's, have, let's talk about what happens when we reach eternity. I love that the Bible says to be absent from the body is to be present with Christ. Oh, that's a great transition for a believer. But we're going to read... Um, in 2 Corinthians, so I don't want you to think it's something that I've just come out up with. I want you to hear what the Bible says about the judgment seat of Christ. And that's what we're talking about this morning. You've heard about the great judgment day, and that's what we're going to talk about. That's found in 2 Corinthians in chapter 5 and verse 10. And it says, for we must all no one gets out of this one. You can't get a doctor's excuse. We must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ that each one may receive the things done in the body according to what has he has done, whether good or bad. Jesus left his home in heaven and he took on a vessel of flesh so that no one would have to spend eternity without God. In Revelations, John says in the 20th chapter, in the 12th verse, he says, I saw the dead, great and small, standing before the throne, and books were opened. A book called the Book of Life was opened. The dead were judged according to what they had done as recorded in the books. And it says in 2015, if anyone's name was not found written in the book of life, he was thrown into the lake of fire. So how do you get your name written into this wonderful book called life? By becoming a believer. Once you become a believer, your name is written down forever engraved in this book of life. So the judgment 
of that day for a believer isn't if I get to spend eternity with or without God. That's already sealed. But what it is about, it's about our works that we have done. See, God has given us grace for this life. He's given us mercy. He's given us forgiveness. But he's also a God that is a responsible leader, teacher, and he wants us to do something with the gifts that he's given us. So that's what a believer's judgment day is going to be. He's going to say, I've given you this life. I've given you this talent, this time, this ability to make this money. What did you do with it? See, it's not going to change your destiny because you know where you're going to spend eternity. But it will change what your heaven is like, what your rewards are there in heaven. We're all going to have to give an account for the life we lived and what we did or didn't do. And our eternity will, will be shaped by our works according to our life story. It's going to be a one-on-one. -on -one. You can't be like Adam and try to say, well, I wasn't going to eat of that fruit. But you know that lady you gave me. See, he still had the choice. In fact, he was held more responsible because God told him face to face, this is what you don't do. This is what you do. So it's not going to matter what was done to you. It's going to matter what you did with what you were given. It's a one-on-one -on -one account. And I think it's better if we start learning to be accountable here so that we already are accountable up there. There's not going to be a blame game. You can't say, well, I didn't know. Well, my parents didn't take me. Well, it's because of this. I wanted to, but I didn't. No, everything is going to be stripped down. That's why it says we, we are going to come before him naked. Thankfully, that doesn't mean we're not going to have any clothes on. But that means everything is stripped down. It's right to the core of everything. In fact, it's the motive. When I was little, I would grow up hearing people say these beautiful prayers. And I would just cringe at the idea that maybe one day I was going to have to pray out loud because it didn't sound anything like theirs. Sometimes theirs sounded like poetry and then strange sometimes I'd be in churches and it sounded like, I don't know, they were speaking this flowery language and I thought I'm never going to get the hang of that one because I just talked to him heart to heart. But it gave me so much comfort when I read in the Bible that it's not about the words, it's about the heart. Some of the biggest, best prayers can be just two simple words if it's heartfelt compared to this long list of this beautiful flowery language. But if it's not coming from the heart, it sounds like tinkling brass in his ear. But you give somebody a heartfelt request, a heartfelt thought towards God, and it's beautiful. It sounds beautiful to his ears. So see, God is going to pay attention to our heart behind the actions. See, eternity is impacted, our eternity is impacted by the judgment day. And our motives are going to be revealed and seen. Our works with the right motives, that's what saves us <laughs> from the fire. But see, this judgment day, it's not about punishments for the believer. It's about rewards. It's about what we're going to receive from him on that day with what we did here on this earth. It's to show what our life's response was to the gifts that he gave us. In fact, I want to read out of 1 Corinthians. And the reason I'm not going to have Heather put it on the screen is because it sounds like a confusing verse. I would read it and I'd be like, what? I don't really get it. I would do the dog tilt and I would just move on. But what this is, does is this is talking about that judgment day for us. It's talking about the believers. And here's what it says. It says in 1 Corinthians starting at chapter 3, 
And I'm going to read 11 through 13. It says, each work will become clear. For that day we'll, we'll declare it because it will be revealed by fire. The fire will test each work of what sort it is. So Paul is telling us, he says, build with care. He means for your kingdoms that you're building here on earth. For no one can lay any foundation other than the one that's already laid, which is Jesus Christ. In other words, he's saying build your life and build your motives and your desires upon this foundation of Jesus Christ. He says, if anyone builds on this foundation using gold, silver, and costly stones, wood, hay, or straw, then their work will be shown for what it is. Because in that day it will be brought to life. It will be revealed with fire. The fire will test the quality of each person's work. If what has been built survives, the builder will receive a reward. If it is burned up, the builder will suffer loss. Here we go. But will still be saved even though as one escaping through the flames. In other words, we're not talking about your eternal position where you're going to be spending eternity. But what he's saying is how whatever you've built here, your life story here, it's going to be revealed what your motives were at the bottom of it. And even if you didn't do what society calls great, wonderful works, he's going to look at the heart. And your reward may be greater than the one that you thought was such a success in life. He's going to look at the heart. If you are someone who you think you don't have much talent, you don't have much skill, you don't have much money in the bank, but every time you see somebody, you're quick to give them a smile and an encouraging word. That's gold. And that's going to make it through the fire. Here's how God does work things, though. Even if you've done good things with a wrong motive, people can still be blessed by it, but you may not get the reward. For instance, you may preach a fiery sermon, and you may know how to be charismatic, and you may know how to work the crowd, and you may get people to come down to the altar, and they give their life to Christ. Their reward will stay. But if you're only doing it because the money is good and you want to build the crowd and you like being seen and you like the compliments and you like the benefits that come with it, then the only kingdom you're going to have is the one that you built here on earth. Oh, you'll make heaven if you are a believer, but you're not going to get rewards for all those because the heart wasn't right. The heart wasn't in it. That's what God means about I'm going to try your works, and I'm going to see what your motives are, and according to your motives, you're going to get rewarded. I don't want to lay my life's work down at the feet of Jesus and be filled with regrets. I don't want, there's a, there's a song that talks about laying your trophies down one day in exchange for a crown. I don't want to come empty-handed. I don't want to say, yeah, this is what you gave me, and you gave me a healthy body, and you gave me a right mind, and, but I was too busy doing what I wanted to do. One wonderful thing about Jesus is we can lay several things down at his feet. He says, come to me all that's heavy, laden, and burdened, and lay them down, and I will give you rest. You can lay down your depression and your anxiety, your, de your sadness, your brokenness, and he will in exchange give you comfort and peace. And I'm so appreciative of that. So often I have said, how can I ever repay him? How can I ever repay him? Even if just the fact that I get to spend eternity with him face to face, if he did nothing else, that's the greatest gift ever. And then the idea that I get to spend eternity with my loved ones that were believers, and I never have to see them hurt again. I never have to say goodbye to them. How can I repay? Well, see, the Bible tells me right here one day, one day I can repay him.
Oh, I want the rewards. Rewards are great. But that's not why I do what I do. Because I don't want to come to him at the end of my life empty-handed. In fact, when it's my time to stand before him, I don't know that there's trucks and trains in heaven. They probably don't need them, but if there are, I would like to say just just a second. They're going to need to bring a truck and a train in for this one because I couldn't hold all that I want to lay at your feet, all the works that I've done for you. See, that's what keeps me motivated. But if you're just doing it for reward, your reward won't be great. But if you're doing it to thank him, to build his kingdom, to make this world a better place. Oh, the things he has in store for you. See, heaven doesn't work on a socialism kind of train of thought. We're not going to receive the same thing when we go to heaven. Oh, it's still going to be beautiful. And it will still be beyond your every imagination. And it will be out of this world amazing. But there's different rewards in, diff- in heaven. There's different things that you're going to receive, and you will receive those according to your works. It doesn't mean that God loves you any less, but he's a fair judge. and He's like, because of this, you get that. God is so good, and he is so kind. I am amazed that we even get something bigger than being able to make heaven. But that's just who he is. I want to be able to say to him, surprise, (laughs) look what I've got for you. Look what I've done for you. But see, you have to do it with the right motive because if, if all I'm wanting to do is to rack up those points, oh, I did that, oh, I did this, oh, I did that, then the only glory that I'm going to get is checking off that checklist. But if you truly say, God, show me what I can do, let me, let me always put you as a priority. Show me who I can help. Show me what you need. Not only am I going to have my heart happy because I was able to give something back to this amazing creator, I'm also going to have my life blessed here on earth. He will make sure that there's certain things that don't touch my household. I know that I received certain blessings because of those in my family that went before me that bowed on their knees when really they just wanted to crawl into bed, that actually came to church when really life was pulling at them so many different directions, but they knew what their priority was because they knew that one day, one day it's going to really matter what I do up here, but I know that right now it matters what I do down here. So you might say, so what do I do? Well, first, I'm going to tell you, don't go to hell. That's the first thing I want you to to do, is I want you to make heaven. And how do you do that? You let him become the Lord of your life. You let him become your Savior. The number two, that's when you trust him and you surrender your life to him. And then number three, get busy finding out what pleases God. Because in the end, that's all that matters. How do we repay him for all the good that he has done? By storing up our treasures in heaven. What's that, you may ask? It's the kind deeds that you did along the way. It's an encouragement that you gave. It's a people that you led to Christ. And one day, one of your rewards is you're going to see even the people that you may have forgotten or didn't even really know, but you impacted their life in some small way. Maybe it was the lady that you paid for her coffee. She was a car behind you. And maybe that completely turned around her day. Maybe she had just said, there's nobody good here on heaven, I mean here on earth. Ooh, that was a bad slip. (laughs) And then your little gesture underneath the dollar changed her whole perspective of mankind. You're going to see that person. That made an impact. 
I can't think of a better reward than that. Oh, I'm sure he'll surprise me with one, but I can't think of a better reward than that to actually one day at one time see the crowd of people that their lives were changed because you were born. That's when you know it was a life worth living. But I don't want to wait till heaven before I get to that point that I realize that this life is worth living. And what you do, it matters and every word that you speak and every decision that you do matters in an eternal perspective. That's how important you are. That's the difference that you make. That's going to be the greatest exchange. It's when at last we get to lay down our trophies, the things that we've done in life. And we get to exchange those for a crown. The closing song that they're going to sing is at the feet of Jesus. At the feet of Jesus, it's referred to in the Bible as that's a teaching place. When te Jesus would get ready to teach, he would sit down, and then others would sit down at his feet. He also, it's replied to as you can lay your burdens down at the feet of Jesus. You give them to him. Also, at the feet of Jesus is where you can lay down. Here is my works. Here's my thank you gift. Here's my thank you for all the things that you've done. And in this song, one of my favorite parts is, let your kingdom be built as my kingdom falls. And every once in a while, we need a perspective to know that this here on earth is going to be gone like that one day. All the things that were so important to you, they're all going to disappear, but what will last throughout eternity is the relationships that you made, the impact that you made, and what you did with this life while we're here. We're sitting here breathing and our heart is beating while others at this moment are taking their very last breath. So while we still have breath, let's get busy building the kingdom for him so that when we get to heaven, the kingdom that we get to see, the kingdom that we get to dwell in, will just blow our minds. If you don't know the Savior, it's really important <laughs> because it's your eternity and it's your soul that I'm talking about. Time is running short. You know me, I don't talk about how it's gonna, he's going to come soon, but... He really is. If you're paying attention to the Bible, a lot of things are getting fulfilled that leads towards his second coming. I don't want to be caught empty-handed. I don't want to be caught with a lot of good intentions. I want to be caught with my basket full of works of saying, Jesus, I may not have done everything, but everything within my power, I did it for you. I can't imagine life without my Savior, life without my Creator. Your soul is too important. This flesh, oh, it's going to die. But what you have inside here, that's going to live on forever. It's very important that if you haven't made that decision, I can't think of a better time than right this moment while your heart is still beating and you have breath in your lungs to make sure that you're secure, your eternity is secured. God bless you.